Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Reclaim Your Wellness. I'm Leslie Foster, your moderator for today's show, which is all about health, weight, and Black women. But before we focus on Black women and weight, let's talk about some of the national statistics regarding this disease called obesity. Now, in fact, 94 million Americans of all ethnicities and ages are living with obesity, this disease called obesity here in the United States, which the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines as a body mass index greater than 30. And while the accuracy of the BMI has been called into question when diagnosing obesity, what is not in question is the impact. Obesity affects every part of the body, every system. It is associated with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, with stroke, with liver disease, and many cancers, just to name a few. More than two in three Black women in the United States are overweight or living with obesity. But for Black women, that number rises to about four out of five. And in 2018, African-American women were 50% more likely to have obesity than non-Hispanic white women. So this is definitely a disease that we need to talk about, we need to educate ourselves about, and we are creating a safe space for conversation today, free of judgment and stigma and bias. There certainly has been more than enough of that. And that brings us to the Black Women's Health Imperative and Healthy Women, two outstanding organizations devoted to improving the health outcomes of women. So here to tell you about their respective organizations and to reclaim your wellness campaign are Sharon Hawks and Beth Battaglio, uh, Badalino, excuse me. But first, we're gonna hear from Sharon. Good afternoon and thank you, Leslie. I'm Sharon Hawks. I'm the founder and director of the Nutrition and Diabetes Education Center and a Black Women's Health Imperative board member. The Black Women's Health Imperative is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and wellness of our nation's 22 million Black women and girls physically, emotionally, and financially. Since 1993, it has been our mission to, av uh, to advance health equity and social justice for Black women across the lifespan through advocacy, advocacy edu education, research, and leadership development. Through investments in evidence-based strategies, we deliver bold and new programs and advocate for health-promoting policies. Often, in order to achieve this, we collaborate with organizations whose goals align with ours. Healthy Women is just such an organization. Together, we've developed the Reclaim Your Wellness campaign. This multifaceted and multicultural campaign is focused on making obesity a healthcare excuse me, priority while improving the lives of people with obesity, changing how the world sees, prevents, and treats obesity as a disease, and ensuring people living with obesity have access to science-based and comprehensive care. Our partnership with Healthy Women provides both organizations with a platform to engage all women, healthcare providers like myself, and policymakers to understand and address the fundamental relationship between socially and racially mediated stress, obesity, and disease. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors of Novo Nordis for providing Black Women's Health Imperative the opportunity to work with healthy women to address this healthcare priority for both organizations. We are so honored to be a part of this program. Thank you so much, Leslie. Sharon, thank you. And now we'd like to bring in Beth Badalino. Thank you, Leslie, and good afternoon. I'm Beth Badalino, CEO of Healthy Women. Healthy Women is the nation's leading independent nonprofit health information source for midlife women. Our mission is to educate women to make informed health choices for themselves and for their families by providing objective, research-based health information. And for more than 30 years, millions of women have turned to Healthy Women for answers to their most personal healthcare questions. We are so excited to have this opportunity to work with the Black Women's Health Imperative on the Reclaim Your Wellness campaign. We know women with obesity have a higher chance of developing serious health conditions and diseases. 
including putting them at, at a higher risk for COVID-19. We also know that people with obesity are often met with prejudice, discrimination, and lack of compassion, resulting in a higher level of shame and stigma. And it is our goal to reduce this judgment and discrimination. This partnership will allow us to drive the conversation about the need to educate the public and healthcare industry about this condition and society's damaging perceptions as well as policy issues that may impact women's access to care, such as the Treat and Re Reduce Obesity Act known as TROIA. The reintroduction of TROIA will expand coverage for Medicare beneficiaries to include screening treatment of obesity from specialists and use of medications for obesity management. Our organizations are partnering to deliver tailored educational and lifestyle content and resources along with interactive tools, podcasts, and stories from real women on the physical and emotional impacts of living with obesity. Webinars such as the one we're hosting today will convene renowned experts to elevate the conversation around underlying causes of obesity and treatments while engaging and educating and empowering women across diverse communities. Exciting fitness classes and healthy cooking sessions, both delivered virtually, will augment the journey to positive health outcomes. Healthy Women joins the Black Women's Health Imperative and our thanks to Novo Nordisk for making this crucial, crucial conversation possible. Enjoy the show. All right. Thank you both Sharon and Beth. And now I'd like to introduce you to our special guest, Lonnie Love. So she is someone that you know and love. <laughs> and we're excited to invite her in for some real talk about health and weight and her journey as a Black woman. Lonnie Love is the, the Emmy and NAACP award-winning co-host of The Real. And when she is not keeping it real on the screen, she's doing it on the airwaves as the co-host of Cafe Mocha with rapper Yogo. She's also an executive producer for a new show called Little Women Unfiltered Atlanta. She keeps busy with multiple TV projects and films. She apparently doesn't sleep very much. She's <laughs> appeared in a documentary called Being on Love about her days growing up in Detroit. And we got to talk a little bit before the show. Um, Lonnie has what we call the grit and the grind of a Detroiter. We hustle hard and we, we, care deeply, we care deeply about others. And I can tell you that this girl from Detroit is excited to talk to a fellow Detroiter, a fellow cast technician, the best <laughs> high school in Detroit. We're going to go yeah. there. And my Delta Soror about how we can reclaim our wellness. And I also bet that you may not know that before Lonnie Starr illuminated big and small screens, she studied to be an electrical engineer. And she is re-engineering a renewed path to peace and health today as she has made it to day 19 of her no sugar challenge. If I could bow down to that discipline, <laughs> I would. But on Zoom, I will simply say thank you and welcome, dear sister, for sharing your time and your heart with us today. It is so good to see you. It is my pleasure, Sora. I mean, I am so excited um, to be here and to talk about, you know, um, a subject that is really near and dear to me. Um, and, you know, when they told me it was going to be you, Leslie, I said, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> Got it. This is my, that's my homie. The feeling is mutual. The feeling is mutual. So let's get right into this because I know The Real has given you a platform to talk about your journey with healthy living and, and weight. And you, Lonnie, have brought that same sort of candor and love to the conversations that you have about your own journey. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why that was so important to you. Why was it so important for you to share your journey with us? because people can relate so many people can relate and you know at the beginning leslie you gave off the statistics the, the, 
the statistics, <laughs> statistics of what is happening with black women. And I'm a black woman. I understand what is happening. I, I wish that BWHI was here 53,000 years ago when I was coming up. Because the fact is, is that when I was, you know, a toddler, we didn't have the information that people have now, you know, um, because of systemic racism, we, um, my mom, you know, had a low paying job. We had the government cheese. Uh, she didn't make much money. So we were going hungry a lot of times. And because of that, I never understood how to eat. I didn't know how to balance meals. I didn't understand that. And so that affected me for the rest of, you know, for my whole life. And now as a grown woman, I'm just learning how to balance, how to eat, how to understand diet. But now I'm on this show and I have to explain my story so that maybe someone else can learn from it. And maybe their daughter doesn't, doesn't grow up the way I grew up with not understanding how to eat, how to balance meals, how to you know um, have exercise. But it, it's, it's so important. And that's the reason why I present my story and I present it on the show and I present it elsewhere. A lot of people though, Leslie, they get upset. A lot of black women, you know, when you're on a national platform like mine, they don't want to talk about stuff like this because they get ashamed. They're embarrassed. They think that, oh, we're putting down Black women. No, we're trying to help Black women understand that there is an issue in our culture. And we, we're just trying to figure out how do we get healthier? How do we lose the weight? How do we drop these numbers for cholesterol and diabetes? So if I have to take a few punches, that's what I'll do. But I want to be an example. And so that's what I try to do with the show. We work with brands that's going to help us. We bring on doctors and people that can teach people how to um, manage, you know, and, and understand what's happening with their bodies and also psych psychologically what is happening with them. And it's just a great platform that I try to use. I think it takes courage to tell the truth about where you are in your walk in the world. Uh, you don't phone it in. You never have. You've always made that a hallmark of, of your connection to other people. And I think that's why people feel the connection to you. You and I both grew up in Detroit, uh, which you know uh, is comprised of beautiful people who migrated from the South, who brought all of those foods and traditions with them. And in a lot of ways, um, we haven't eaten as healthy. We haven't moved quite as much as maybe we should. And we're learning more about how those things contribute to our health now and our health in the long long run. So I've been watching some of the videos that you've shared about your journey. And I wonder, you know, one of the things that you've done is, is publicly said, you know, I'm going to start trying to take sugar out of my diet. And that is not an easy thing to do. Uh -uh. And that impacts you completely. Talk a little bit about what these past 19 days have been like for you. Hell, <laughs> sugar is in everything. It's in everything. <laughs> Everything. First of all, the reason why I, I'm doing these challenges, I do one once a month because I want to do it along with my followers and my fans. And I call them my family because I want us all to be healthier. And so if I do it publicly, I'll be held accountable. Mm. That's why. So mm -hmm. in January, it was no alcohol. That was the challenge. So February, because it's the shortest month and it was Black History Month, I said, OK, <laughs> we're going to do no sugar. And so people are still with me, but it's so hard because sugar is in everything. And you got to understand with these challenges, we're learning. We're learning that, you know, we didn't think that sugar was in ketchup. You know, it's like, and there are different types of sugar. It's not just the regular sugar. There's, you know, the fructose and all these mm -hmm. syrups and things like that. So we're all learning while we're doing these challenges. And it's just amazing because, you know, I want to show the picture that after 19 days, I feel a lot better, um, but I had to make adjustments. And the adjustments, you know, it's like if I go out to eat, like, I don't know if people can see that, but I can see it's a big difference. Yeah, it's a big it, it just after just just after 19 days. That was me in January. Mm -hmm. And then this is me now. So it's like you can tell it's like the skin is different. And it's not about 
the, the, the looks. It's about getting healthier. And that's what I want sisters to understand is that we have to get healthier. So if I have to do a challenge, okay, you guys hold me accountable. I'll hold you accountable. We switch recipes, but it's hard. I cannot wait for this month to be over. <laughs> Ease back in though, Lonnie. Don't go don't go from zero to sixty. No, I won't. Want the sugar all that time. That's the thing too. It's about planning. And so I'm going mm -hmm. to um I'm setting up time with a nutritionist. You know, we have tools now that I didn't have when I was growing up as a girl you know, that, that are available to me. So I'm using those tools now. And so that I won't go back that, you know, and I'm just learning about my body and I'm, and, but you know, for me, the challenges are really helping and it's really helping a lot of people. And, and we're all becoming this family of, we're going to do these challenges in March is going to be the, the um, exercise challenge. So everybody going to be exercising. We do something every day. And I, when I talk about the no sugar challenge, I'm, even if you can't, we're just saying, just reduce your sugars, you know, because, you know, some people you can't cut it out, just reduce and start looking at labels and things like that. So we really are becoming a family. It's, it's fun and we're getting healthier while we're doing it. One of the things that you've also shared about your journey is how many things you've actually tried that did not work. You mm -hmm. tried to fast, you lost weight. You, you've done a lot of the yo-yo dieting where you lost the weight and you gained it back. And so what have you learned from that experience about uh, what your body needs for long-term changes? For long-term changes, I had to just sit down and understand what is it that is the right plan for me? Because sometimes you do have to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. And at one point I was not disciplined. I was doing like before the pandemic, I was traveling every weekend. So I would just, you know, I would be on stage. I would sit there and I would just eat anything. And then the pandemic happened. And if I have to say the one good thing out of this pandemic for me was that it made me sit down in my house and it made me look at myself and go, what have you been doing? What have you been? You need to get control of yourself. You need to get control of your health because, you know, studies show that with COVID, you know, the sugar, it it is attached to sugar, you know. And so I had to sit down and start making plans. And so while I was isolated, I started really, you know, making plans about getting myself healthier, getting back to moving, getting back to cooking my own foods. So I would have to say that I had to really start making plans. And that's why I tell all of my followers and my fans, it's like, Figure out what it is that you need to do to get yourself healthier, but you're going to have to have some discipline. And sometimes we don't have discipline because we got our kids, you know, we got this man over here, he tripping, we got work over here tripping, but sometimes you have to sit and, and, and I started meditating too, Leslie, and that has helped me mm. to sit back and focus. And ever since I started focusing, now I have a lot more discipline. I have a lot more plans. And my life is coming. I feel like my life is coming back. You feel different now. Totally different. Totally well, different. How, how do you just describe for us how this change has made you feel? Like, tell us, you know, do you have more energy? Um, you know, tell us what this is like. This well, feels first of all, good. my knees are much better. I used to talk to my two knees, the brother and the sister. <laughs> and I, But now my knees feel so much better. You'll be surprised. I think I'm down like 20 pounds. The difference that 20 pounds has on your body, just, just on those knees, it's totally different. You know, I, I get up in the morning now. And first of all, you know, as a comic, I used to drink on the weekends during my shows. It's nice now to wake up and you don't have that little, you know, alcohol hangover, that headache. It's nice to wake up and it's like, wow, you're clear headed. My energy has improved. You know, my thinking has improved. My movement has improved. Everything has improved. And it's like the, blo the bloatiness that I used to have. I don't have that. I can slide in the clothes now, you know, because I'm sitting here, you know, taping from home. So a lot of things have happened, but I had to put the discipline. And so now that I'm disciplined, I see the rewards. So I just try, I'm trying to just keep going and, and keep myself focused and centered. How have you found your way in an industry that does not 
for all it says about coveting diversity, it doesn't always covet that when it comes to black women. You have to look a certain way. Your hair has to be a certain way. You have to talk a certain way. How do you think you've been able to make it um, in this industry that has been hyper-focused on being thin and, and, and really being able to sort of be you? I had to um, just, I accept my, myself for who I am. And I don't look at myself as being a flawed person. So what I would do, especially like early on when I had to do auditions, I would use, you know, my, my weight. I would use my physical to help me to stand out. And I just changed my thinking process. When you change your thinking process, it's like, you know, I may stay this size all my life. So Hollywood is going to have to deal with it. You know, I'm not going to stop trying to, you know, go through my dream because you think I'm not supposed to look the way you want me to look because this makes me stand out. And so that's what I tell people when you're trying to to do something or go somewhere. And, you, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, well, I want to fit in a certain dress. Or I want to look a certain way. Sometimes that may not happen. So if that doesn't happen, what are you going to do? You have to be okay with who you are at this present moment. And so throughout the industry for 30 years, I've always been the big black girl. And you know what? I'm not going to be ashamed for it. I've never been ap apolo apologetic for it. This is who I am. It makes me stand out. And that's the way I've done movies. I've done talk shows. I've done, you know, everything that the thin girls have done is because I accepted myself. And I think that that has been shown when when executives see me, they see that and they're like, you know what? She is who she is. And we're just going to accept it. There's change happening, you think, as a result of, of people like you, Lonnie, who have said um, there's room for all of us. Right. There's this definitely room. For all of us. You know, you might have to make a little more room for me, but it's fine. though. <laughs> and the thing is, is that it's, it's just the average woman in America, all races is a size 18. So why, you know, and it's nothing wrong if you want to be a zero. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's stop with these unrealistic goals and putting all this pressure on women, especially black women. And then we try to shame people. I'm like, no. So if I had to be the person to step up and say, no, this is how it's going to be. I'm just happy that, you know, they see it now. And now it's more opportunities for more women. You have the Octavia Spencers now. You have the Nicole Byers. You know, these women are phenomenal. And it's, the, it's they're more than just their shell. They're just wonderful people that entertain and they want to act to and they represent parts of this country. So you have to let them have a chance to be in it. And so that's what's happening. Talk to me about sort of the easiest and the hardest part of this journey. It, it would seem to me that the hardest part is really the acknowledgement to self, something all of us have to do when we're when we're assessing sort of where we are and where we want to be of what we need to do. But I'm sure there's been sort of a pendulum shift for you. So for women who might be listening, who might be inspired by your journey, and this might be their day one, and they're wondering what's the easiest part of this and what's the most challenging part? Can you talk a little bit about that? The hardest part is fighting, like, like we were just saying, fighting other people, trying to please other people. That's the because naturally, especially as women, we want to please everybody. We want to please our employer. We want to please our man. We want to please our children. And sometimes those people in our lives can look at us and say, you need to do this. You need to do that. You have to block that out. And you have to ask yourself, you know, self, what is it that I want? That's the hardest part is stop pleasing everybody else and do what you want. Because once you do that, you can relax and you can, you can start to feel a shift and your mind will shift. So that's, that's, I would say, is the hardest part. The easiest part is once that happens, it just snaps like that. You know, um, we um, I'm doing the sugar challenge, like we've been saying. And on the show, The Real, we had to do some integrations, which is sponsorships. And it was edible arrangements. And they sent to my house like 
three big packages of cheesecakes and donuts and you know and production felt bad they like you're on a sugar diet i said we gotta you know make this money i held up that i didn't even lick it because my <laughs> mind my mm -hmm. mind is here it's like this this is fine i mm -hmm. you know i can look at sweets and i'll be like oh i want no i'm gonna do it here here you go now we sell it that's the difference that's the easy part once you know what you want to do and it clicks and you make your plan you're okay you'll be fine and it sounds like that's really what we're talking about here when we talk about reclaiming your wellness it's not about doing a diet it's about making a change for your life that you can embrace, that can be part of you, that's an extension of you, that feels authentic for you. And it sounds like that's what you're saying. That's what you've tapped into. That's what's made you successful. Definitely. I mean, I never used to pick up, you know, the uh, a product and look at the ingredients. Now I do that. And I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm learning. And I'm like, well, do I really want to, this has a lot of sugar. You know, do I really want to deal with this? No, I don't want to deal with this because I'm like, I'm okay. Or even like when we came to the alcohol, I do club soda and lime now, you know? So now I go out to dinner and my friends, you know, they have wine, they're having their, their cocktails. I'm like, give me a club soda and, and, I'm, and I'm not missing anything. I'm just, I just, but I had to click into it. Once you click into it and, you know, I want to say to people out there, don't force it, let it happen. Let it let it happen because it will happen if you focus. It will happen. And once it once it happens, nobody can deter you. You'll be okay. Nobody can deter you. And your reward will you will feel better. You will look better, you know, and, and people will start like, well, what's happening? It's like it, I clicked in. Is there some value to building community around this embrace of a new lifestyle so that you know, in this pandemic, people feel alone. They feel the separation. And so I wonder if in your experience, I mean, you have your sisters on the real and you have your broader sisterhood beyond that, but do you see some value in creating community to help reach your goals and to have help people on the journey with you? Well, that's why I was doing the challenges and I reached out to people um, for the challenge. And I have people all over the country that are like, you know, I always like go, you know, when I'm I'm doing a challenge, I'll go no sugar challenge day 19 and I'll give me like what I'm going through. And I'm like, who's still with me? I get so many people that I'm still with you, Lonnie, and I'm trying this or I'm trying that. And we switch recipes. That's what I'm saying. We're starting a family. We're starting a community. And that's what's important. So we all holding each other accountable. I'm a cheerleader for them. They're a cheerleader for me. So I would say to anybody that's trying to do something, start your own little community of people. Maybe your girlfriend ain't going to do it with you. Maybe your man ain't going to do it. Mm -mm. Don't worry about that. Find people out there. That's what the computer for. Find people out there that are just like you. It's like, you know what? Yeah, let's try this. Let's let's try the exercise challenge. And you guys communicate that way and you have your own little community so you're not alone. You're never alone. That's a wonderful thing to impart. And I think it's really important, especially during this time, to kind of build community around what we need and what we need to have. Um, before we bring in the rest of our panelists, Lonnie, we've talked quite a bit about your journey. I wonder if there's something you want to share about what's next for you that might be helpful to women who may be embarking on this journey. I tell women what, you know, right now I'm starting to meditate. And meditate is different from prayer. So I would invite you to, there are a lot of applications where you can learn how to meditate and focus. It doesn't take long, five minutes, 10 minutes. And it really is something that will get you focused, especially when you're trying to improve your health. And lastly, um, check in with me. I'm going to have an exercise challenge for the month of March. Well, we do something every day in March. I don't care if it's just five minutes of getting up and bending over. Some of y'all know <laughs> this is what we're going to do. So everybody just keep in touch with me. I answer on my um, IG. We're going to get healthy and I'm going to keep getting healthy with my sisters. I love everybody. And thank you for this. I appreciate it so much. 
And we can see why people are drawn to the real talk and the spirit of Lonnie Love. Thank you so much for sharing your time, but mostly for sharing your heart because it takes vulnerability and courage to do that. And you are the perfect combination of both. Lonnie is going to stay with us as we open up and embark on this next part of our journey. And I'd like to introduce our other panelists who will be here imparting some other great information for you on this journey. We have Dr. Fatima Cody Stan who is an obesity physician in Massachusetts at the General Hospital there with Harvard Medical School. We have Chef G. Garvin, acclaimed chef, author, James Beard, nominee, TV personality, entrepreneur, sitting in the restaurant, I believe, that he opened 10 days ago. He is a hearty, hearty soul. We've already compiled a list of wishes for food for him. He's shaking his head like, what did I get into? And finally, Courtney Snowden, founder of Black Girl Magic, the Peloton edition. I, I met Courtney when she was a deputy mayor in Washington, D.C. And my, how things have changed since then. So there's so much to get to. Let's jump right in. And Dr. Stanford, I want to talk with you. You had the opportunity to listen to, to Lonnie talk about her journey, talk about the changes that she made. And I think uh, one of the things that you like to impart to all of us around the disease of obesity is this misnomer that food is at the center of it. So let's talk about what it means to be a black woman walking in the world, what it means to be a black woman walking in a pandemic world and how all of these things contribute to this disease called obesity. Absolutely. Well, Leslie, it is a delight to be here and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to just speak on this. And when we think about this disease that is obesity, it's important to recognize that it is a complex multifactorial disease where development, behavior, um, all play a role in a person's likelihood of having this disease that we call obesity. And we hyper-focus, I think, often on food and its role. And I don't think that we <coughs> recognize the complexity or the pathophysiology, how the brain is the most important organ and regulating whether or not we eat or we don't and regulating whether or not we store adipose, which is fat tissue, or we don't. And when we talk about this issue that you just brought up, Leslie, about what it means as a black woman, what, what does that, how does that play into this dynamic of how much fat or adipose tissue. It's actually an active organ, how much we store. It's important to recognize that issues such as systemic and structural racism actually lead to increased rates of storage of adipose tissue in Black women. And this was actually seen in data that was published out of the Black Women's Health Study, which comes out of Boston University Medical Center. Dr. Yvette Cozier actually looked at exposures, either everyday racism or lifetime racism to discern whether or not that actually contributed to obesity. Mm -hmm. And the stress associated with exposure to racism, either every day or over the course of a lifetime, actually leads to more storage of adipose or fat. So these are the complex things that I think about when I'm talking to my patients that actually have this disease of obesity. I look at food, I look at activity, but I have to look at the whole person. I have to look at their family history. I have to look at issues related to medications. They may be prescribed for other issues that may be causing weight gain. I need to be looking at all of these factors and then using this information to inform how I'm going to individualize and personalize care for that person that's sitting in front of me. I'm glad that you talk about personhood because what I've learned from you is that the words that we use to describe this disease are really impactful. So you're not an obese person, right? You are somebody who is living with obesity as a disease and that shift in our lexicon is a huge, huge thing. Tell us what the textbook diagnosis is of obesity, because I also think some people may have some misunderstanding of what the term actually means. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because at the beginning of the show, I think you guys talked a little bit about BMI, right? This idea of body mass index where we used to classify. And so according to the CDC and the World Health Organization, a person has obesity if their BMI is, is 30 plus. 
But the problem with BMI as a single or individual measure is it just tells me height and weight. It doesn't tell me what type of weight it is. Is it fat? Is it water? What type of weight is it? Where is it distributed? Um, and so I think it's important for us to recognize, for example, with black women, we tend to carry a lot of weight in our hip, buttock and thigh region. That tends to be not as bad for our health as than if we carry it in our abdominal region. So when it's a, in our abdominal region, it's around all of those really important organs, which leads to metabolic disease like diabetes or fatty liver. Um, and so we have this definition that's kind of a, a straight line of like, this is what you are, but doesn't take into to account those complexities that we just talked about, or even the differences that exist, you know, between different um, racial and ethnic groups. Um, so it's important for us to factor that in. But according to the definition, a BMI of greater than or equal to 30 is considered to be have someone that has obesity. And then we have mild, moderate, and severe obesity, and that's how we determine treatment. So mild obesity would be a body mass index of 30 to 34.9. Moderate obesity would be a body mass index of 35 to 39.9. And then persons are considered to have severe obesity if their body mass index is greater than or equal to 40. And so we do make treatment recommendations somewhat along those lines. But like I said, when I'm working with an individual, I'm not just looking at that population data, I'm looking at the person that's actually in front of me and making sure I tailor my treatment strategy to fit them and what their lifelong struggle may have been surrounding their excess weight. I wanna ask you one last question about this before we bring in Chef Garvin and Courtney, because even the CDC says that BMI is a poor proxy for health, right? Yeah. So if we know that it has limited value, what is the greater determinant for whether someone is obese or, or where they need to be on the spectrum. So I like to incorporate something that's extremely cheap, extremely useful, that I think really is the, one of the key factors. So I think we can use the BMI, but let's add an additional element, and that is waist circumference. Um, mm -hmm. We can use a cheap tape measure, you know, somewhere in the order of 2 to $5, um, if you look it up on, on one of our friendly online sites. Um, and measure actually at the belly button on your bare skin and measure around your circumference. Now, I'm not for men. Men always tell me, well, I wear a 42 inch waist. You know, yes, you wear your pants below where I want you to measure. I want you to measure at your belly button and around. For women, that target should be 35 inches or less. Mm -hmm. And for men, 40 inches or less. Now, if you're noticing that we have significant differences from that, then I am worried. I am then worried as a doctor for you. When I put that piece of the puzzle together with the BMI, which gives me an idea of where that fat's being distributed and whether it's contributing to heart issues, whether it's contributing to diabetes or fatty liver or all these other diseases, that measure together, which is simple, cheap, easy to obtain, I think is really something that we can utilize, Leslie, to really enhance our determination of one's weight status and how bad it is for their health. Let's talk about food because food obviously is a key part uh, of a healthy lifestyle. And Chef Garvin, uh, you've been cooking since you were 13. I mean, I need to have you have a conversation with um, uh, you know, folks in my house. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, no, but what have you learned from, from cooking at such a young age and, and this whole idea of healthy cooking that would really be beneficial for families and for women who are the head of households in many cases are having to navigate and cook healthy foods and try to stay healthy themselves. Uh, thank you. First of all, um, Lonnie, ladies, I, I absolutely love what you're saying. It's incredible, Lonnie, your story, your courage um, to talk about your journey is, it is absolutely amazing that you're willing to do that uh, with or without a platform because everyone listens, even those who don't, you know, watch you on television. Um, doctor, your, your insight is just, um, it's brilliant. Um, and I'm humbled to be here. Um, you know, for me, <clears throat> you know, I, I will always start with saying food didn't change my life. Food saved my life. And for me, it's about education first, right? Everything Lonnie talked about, everything the doctor's talking about, it's about your purchases, right? It's about making sure that you're holding, you know, your grocery store, whether it's in Buckhead or on Cascade, accountable for what's available, right? Um, and I don't think people really know how to educate themselves when it comes to food, right? People talk about, you know, 
Southern food um, in a way that it's the absolute worst for you, but it's actually not, right? It's how you, a chicken is a chicken is a chicken is a chicken, right? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna buttermilk, roll it, double, fry it, and yes, it's not gonna be good for you, right? It's probably but, amazing though. It might be amazing. <laughs> But, but then you see them at the doctor's office, right? <laughs> so, you know, it really starts with education, you know, understanding what is couscous, understanding what is tabbouleh, understanding, you know, what is the differences between white rice and brown rice, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding barley and oats, things that we've just never, ever been a part of, right? You don't go into the grocery store in my mother's neighborhood and find brown rice. You, you just don't, right? How you create your, your vegetables, right? Growing your own vegetables, the ability to grow your own vegetables. i tell you something. I grew up in Atlanta and before the age of 16, the only thing we got from the grocery store were, were toiletries, garbage bags. You know, my mother grew tomatoes, carrots, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. all of our vegetables. That's what we knew. So I think it really starts with educating people and making them understand that taste is really psychological, right? Like Lonnie said, well, you know what? If I wake up every day and I want a chocolate chip that I have every single day, that's not really taste. That's, that's mental. That's psychology, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you can reverse that psychology, you really won't miss that sugar, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing for us you know, especially in the Southern region, right? I defend Southern food because I know its capabilities, right? I know what it can offer. And, and, and if you can reverse the psychology of how you prepare your foods, then you can reverse every single uh, element that we're uh, potentially talking about. The food is a source of strength. It is a source of soul. It deposits the nutrients we need to move and breathe and, and contribute in the most powerful ways we can to the world around us. And you've really kind of focused so much of your effort on helping us to make mm -hmm. those changes a bit better. I understand that you're going to be back with another segment of Reclaim Your Wellness back on Sunday, February 28th, which kicks off Obesity Care Week. And you're going to be cooking for something called the Healthy Soul Food Sunday. That sounds amazing. Ooh, yeah. the healthy you know, things that we can be be doing on a day like that. Well, you know, here's the thing. Though that's where I shine. That's what I do. What I do, right? Taking you know the average uh, recipe ingredient and doing something amazing with it, so that you can understand how to be amazing with your food. Um, so as you mentioned, um, I'm going to do this on February 28th. I think it's going to start at three o'clock. I'm going to just take some some average ingredients and I'm going to show you how not only to prepare something that's healthy, but also tastes good. Because that that is where the lines are blurred. People go, well, if it's healthy, it must be grilled vegetables. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right. There's so many different things that you can do. And that's what I'm excited about is, is this is everything I know and love and showing you how you can create. You can take simple ground turkey and do five different things, turkey meatballs, turkey burgers, turkey tacos, turkey lasagna, turkey chili, right? And it is really good for you. There's so many great things. So yeah, I'm excited to do that. It's gonna be three o'clock, uh, February 28th on Sunday. I'm gonna create a great menu. I'm gonna have people cooking along. I'm gonna send out some uh, recipes, uh, some ingredient lists. And um, you know, my philosophy is simple, you know, help people live longer through uh, educating them in food. Chef, I know they're it wasn't for Chef. I wouldn't know about brown rice being no sugar. He's mm. the one that, that hooked me up on that. You know, I thought I couldn't eat rice anymore. He's no, no, no. Use brown rice. I was like, yeah. oh, and it, it's great. And That's you know what? Brown. I want to say this to you. I, I, I don't know how if people really understand the difficulty in you know setting yourself up to not do something. Right now, I'm not doing uh, butter or carbs or sugar. Um, and I've found to be more successful after three days, it becomes a little easier. And yeah. then you find that you don't miss it again. And, and I'm clearly not medically qualified to say this, but in my opinion, it's all in my head, right? Yeah. If, I, if I go, and look, I'm French trained. Everything has butter in it. I say, but, 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 but to finish. <laughs> but you start thinking, okay, I got to have this sauce just right. I got to add a little butter. It's not the case. Did you have yeah. any withdrawal symptoms? Because, I mean, it's like that first two days, I did have like a little headache. And, you know, but I drank water. I took a little bit of aspirin just because I had to work. 
you know, and I, I needed to focus. But after that, after that, that third day, I was, I was fine. I was yeah, really no, fine. I did. I did. I, you know, and you know what's worse though, and I, I don't want to take up too much time. Everything we see on TV just looks so good. Yes. All of a sudden, I never thought about eating Doritos or or, or a Burger King burger. I'm like, oh my god. So good. Yeah. 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 Yes. I think it may be undermining my own progress. You know, during this pandemic stuff, it's been really hard having to share awful information. And so during the commercial breaks, we'll sit through and I'll go, oh my God, did you see this on this Instagram page? Look at this chocolate thing with the <laughs> lava coming out. It's insane. And then, you know, five minutes later, I'm like, does anyone have chocolate on this? Does anyone have chocolate anywhere? Can I have a piece of chocolate? Uh, so that mind-body connection that you talk about is significant. And thank you for sharing with us how both of you are making those changes. I got to weave Courtney Snowden in here because Courtney has made some incredible health decisions of her own that have literally transformed her mind, her body, her spirit. Yeah. And she went on to create Black Girl Magic, the Peloton edition, which has yes. thousands upon thousands upon thousands of women supporting each other, pedaling away, helping to build community. And Courtney, why don't you talk to us about your journey to a healthier lifestyle? Oh, thank you so much, Leslie. It's an honor to be with each and every one of you. I will tell you, uh, the pandemic has been really tough for all of us in a variety of ways. There's been a ton of loss, but the sort of silver lining for me has been the unique time and ability to focus, to Lonnie's point, on myself uh, and make sure that I was taking very good care of myself. So over the last seven months, I've lost about 120 pounds. Uh, that with a very restrictive diet, which we could talk about, but also through this Peloton bike and the Peloton community that I've helped to grow and build and found. We're about 17,000, more than 17,000 Black women who center Peloton uh, in their fitness and wellness journey. And the most beautiful part about it is while we were busy saving the democracy, Black women that is, while we were busy raising our families, Black women that is, while we were busy changing the world, we have used this group of 17,000 women to sharpen each each other, straighten our crowns, as we say, because we're all queens, as we call ourselves and each other. But importantly, we've been able to support each other through getting our bodies together, our minds together, our diets together, um, and most importantly, really focusing on taking care of ourselves so that we can do all of the things that Black women do on a daily basis to change the world. What I love about your group is, you know, amongst us, you know, there's like the shiners and the blenders. And so like I might consider myself to be a shiner in my field. But when I'm in the Peloton group, I'm a blender. Right. I'm just I'm just trying. To, I'm just trying not to get fined. Right. So, you know, you're pedaling away, you're pedaling away. And you can find people in the group, women in the group who are in your lane, who can say this is how you build endurance. Right. This is how you keep going on the days when you don't want to get on the bike. This is how you steal or maximize 20 minutes of time for yeah. your health. It's about really putting you on the list. It's about putting you first on the list, not just on the list. And I think that's what we've been really focused on. You know, in particular, Black women, I think, have been too focused on taking care of everybody else. And this group of women, look, you know, it is a group of 17,000 upwardly mobile African-American women who have the resources to buy sometimes one Peloton, sometimes two Pelotons and a tread so their spouse doesn't touch their bike. Um, and they have that equipment in their homes. And often their cousins and families are calling to borrow money or get other resources and help. And they're raising families and they're working very high powered jobs. I mean, look, you have two members sitting here right now. Leslie is who she is. And I, 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 I've been somebody once upon a time in my life. Um, and you so are somebody. <laughs> you are all somebody. I think we are. But the reality is uh, this is really this group has really helped so many of our members focus mm -hmm. very specifically on themselves. And if it's the, if it's 10 minutes that they have to work out or an hour and 40 minutes as some of our members do, um, it is a real and intentional focus on making sure they carve out time for themselves first. And I'll tell you a powerful piece about this group of community. For, for, for a while, uh, I bought the bike in 2017 and didn't really use it. I was an inconsistent user of the Peloton. I created this group for a couple of reasons. One, hair, right? So normally I have a cute little blowout. Now I have cute curly, but I keep I have to be able to figure out a solution for my hair as I work out. That is a black woman challenge. Um, and, 
Gorilla Glue. No, don't you worry. I was <laughs> just, oh, that poor baby. Oh, goodness. That poor. And, 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 and just to be clear, we're really happy that the glue is out of her hair. It's out. It, it, it is. It's part of the saga. Yes. She's on the reel today. You can see the whole interview. So, oh, okay. okay. Go ahead, Courtney. I would just say that's why culturally competent medical care is important because I believe it was a black male doctor who figured that out for her and how to get it off her hair. Yeah. So yeah, this is why competent medical care is important. Um, but what I will say is, you know, uh, I, I was inconsistent. I created this group and all of a sudden we were, we were three or four. We grew to 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 12,000, 17,000, more than 17,000 women. And that means at any moment in time, I can pop in the Facebook group or go on our Instagram page and say, hey, I really don't want to ride today. Is there someone who wants to get on with me? And 10 mm -hmm. and 20 women will hop on and both hold me accountable, but push me too. Uh, and that's been really, really a very exciting development about this group. We support each other on the on the bike and as we work out, but we also support each other in life. And I'll say, you know, I have a great group of African-American female friends who we push each other. And again, we sharpen each other, other each other's iron. But for some in our group, this is a new experience for them to have a significant collection of women pushing them and supporting them and helping them. Uh, and so for me, I will say it has been one of the greatest honors of my life to develop this platform for us to be able to do just that for each other. And we're That's seeing great nice. progress. Women are dropping weight. Their numbers are changing. Blood pressure is going down. Cholesterol mm -hmm. is improving. People are getting off their diabetes. Mm -hmm. That means we're winning. Uh, and if we can get more women focused on themselves, we can make the world an even better place. Because again, that's what we do. It's fantastic. I want to say too, the Peloton um, for the bike it is also a, a great um, just floor Peloton too. And I oh, use yeah. the music. Mm -hmm. I use the music. Do you course. use the app? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to, it's only like thirteen dollars a month. That's right. That's it's all you do for that. It's, yeah. And so if you can't afford the bike or if you don't have room for the bike just yet, you can still get Peloton. In March, we're going to do, I'm going to join you, Courtney. In March, we're going to do the um, the exercise challenge. But, you know, like floor exercise, we got to move more as we black women. We more. Have to move more. So Lonnie, I what I'm saying about the app is, you know, you can, and you know this, I actually do meditations through the app. There's yoga, there's bar classes, there's uh, strength classes, cardio classes, all things off the bike and the tread. I don't work for Peloton. I should just mention that. Um, and I so, think they should be paying you, Courtney. Um, I'm just saying. I know. I just, I just wanted to put that out there. Who can email them to tell them that? Um, yes. But what I will say is the, the beauty of it is there are all of these opportunities to connect to fitness. And I tell everyone all the time in line, we should talk about a challenge in the group that you can help us lead. We can do it together. Um, but what I will say is even if Peloton isn't your thing, that is okay. You have got to move your body. My weight loss journey this most recent time, because there've been a few weight loss journeys in my life, <laughs> I started at 348 pounds. And I didn't even realize I had gotten that big, but I could not get on a slide with my my then three year old. And I was pretty wow. devastated about it. He's like, mommy, come. And I couldn't do it. And that day I decided I have to make a change. But the most important thing was has been not the physical weight that I've lost. It was the unseen weight that I lost, the mental, emotional and spiritual weight uh, that I have been able to lose through the process of taking better care of myself. And that's why I'm so hungry. This has become in some ways my ministry because Black women in particular deserve to be loved and to love ourselves and to take very good care of ourselves. And it's just been this Peloton platform and this group that has allowed me to really focus on that in a very intentional way. And I just I really just want all of us uh, to be able to have that joy and, and love. I think that's wonderful. I, I want to thank all of you for this part of our, our segment here. I know Chef has to leave around too. So I want to start getting these questions to all of you before you leave. And Chef, you would be happy to know that in this Peloton group, there's a lot of conversation about food, women supporting each other on creating healthy things. There was a, a comment from someone recently who talked about how much trouble she was having with sugar. And you had all these women saying, okay, try almond flour. Try this instead. Try that instead. And to that point, there's a question here from someone who says, how do you get your family to make adjustments when butter is a main food group for you? And you talked about being French trained chef and about 
the hesitancy, perhaps, I guess, among some in, in our culture to um, have confidence in a healthier food source. What would you say to this person who has written that about really trying to get the family to come away from butter and maybe embrace something healthier? Listen, I'm going to give you a really short, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into Lonnie's lane and try to be funny. <laughs> oh. just, just don't buy it. I told my mother, it's a very simple situation. She says, but these kids always, every time I see them, they got candy. I said, my kids don't buy candy. Y'all buy candy, right? Mm -hmm. So it starts with a certain level of discipline. When you guys say discipline, you think of, you know, controlling yourselves. I say discipline and discipline, right? When you go to the grocery store, you create your list, right? By creating your list, not only will you stay on budget, but you say time and you're more efficient and you don't buy things that you don't need. Mm. First, African Americans, we shop by habit. We just up and down the line, up and down the line, <laughs> we just picking up everything that we are used to picking up, right? Butter, eggs, cheese, something sweet. If you create your list and butter is not on that list, your family has no option other than not to eat it. You know what my mom used to say? You sit that long enough and get hungry enough, you'll eat it. You know, I like how you said discipline, and there is a question in here about how we switch this discipline thought process to not be a negative word. Lonnie, I think it would be great to have you and Courtney kind of weigh in on this, having been on your own journeys and talking clearly about the need for that as an epicenter thing, like discipline at the core of what you're trying to do. It's, it's, just what, it's just what G just said. You know, you have to have a plan. Um, and I'm going to use that discipline. Plan. Yeah. I go and I, and I shop every Sunday and I make my list and there's stuff that I just don't put on my list. I put certain things on, I put my fresh fruits and I have to do it on Sundays because that food will last like three or four days for the week for me. So mm -hmm. now I've made it a habit. That's my plan. And mm -hmm. there's stuff that I don't, I don't put the Cokes on anymore. I don't, you know, put the, the sugar stuff. I don't do the sweets. I do my plan and then I make my food and now I'm done and, and it's okay. It's like, I'm not, I can walk past, I have a grocery store the minute you walk in, it's all the, this, the bake set, the bakery ses session where you got all the cookies. I walk straight through there. Right now, you devil is a lie. Now I'm about to <laughs> straight to the vegetable section. What about you, Courtney? <laughs> so for Pelotoners, we can all quote different instructors and their motivational uh, one-liners, but there's one line that sticks with me um, that Alex Toussaint says all the time, which is how you treat yourself is how you feel about yourself. And I actually had to stop thinking about it as discipline because discipline for me is about something I can fail at and I'm really bad at failing, but then if I do or I don't achieve what I set out to achieve, I start to beat myself up. It's a really bad cycle and then all of a sudden I'm in the kitchen. So really the way that I think about it is uh, this is about how I treat myself and how do I feel about myself and how do I want to feel about myself? I want to be proud of myself. I want to, I want my kids to be proud of me and I want to present as my best self. And that means I have to make some really significant and hard changes in my life. It means I have to work out. It means I have to make good choices about what I put in my body so that I can be my best self. And so discipline is what underlies that. But the reality is for me, discipline was too big of a word to tackle um, because it felt like I could fail at it. So I just want to, I just treat myself better. Come on, come on, chef. Come on, yeah, chef. I'm going to tell you also a, a huge <laughs> misconception. People think dessert means sweet. Dessert doesn't necessarily mean something sweet, right? You can, if you, listen, if we can get a couple of guys to the moon, right? And we can figure <laughs> out how to broadcast a show like The Real all over the world. Yeah. I am pretty certain that we can figure out how to make ice cream without sugar. I'm pretty certain that Greek yogurt will suffice with a certain quality granola, right? Granola doesn't have to be sweet. There's a certain fruit salad you can make that doesn't have to be sweet. So let's make sure people understand dessert don't mean banana cream pie, mm -hmm. right? It could be bananas with some roasted or toasted pine nuts. Mm. Again, it's, if you can get yourself to psychologically get out of your own way and allow yourself to try something new and different, it's just like ordering sorbet. People go, well, I'm going to get the sorbet. 
you just talking about you talking about frozen Kool Aid. G, add that to the list of what you're going to send to me. Okay, <laughs> banana, roasted pine nuts. I'm a, <laughs> I want to bring in Dr. Stanford because you are an avid runner, right? I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to say goodbye oh, real quick. Thank you, uh, ladies, ladies, I love y'all and y'all are incredible. And thank you for the work you're doing because you are saving black men's lives by being great leaders and role models. And let me tell you something, you black women, we do not exist without y'all. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chef. We're going to make a discipline. Discipline. We're going to disappoint ourselves going right, forward. Yeah. That's your Friday find from Chef G. Garvin. And we'll hopefully get to talk to you again soon. But Dr. Stanford, I wanted Absolutely. to ask you because you are an avid runner. You obviously talk a lot about the food body movement connection. Mm -hmm. And there's some questions coming in from women who really want you to drill down into this issue of BMI. Because mm -hmm. if you've been to the doctor, you know what that lion looks like. You know, they check the box where you are and you figure out whatever it is. Um, they, women are asking to know more about this, and they also want to know what role hormones play in yes. obesity in postmenopausal women. There's a lot of questions about those two things. Well, first of all, you know, so I think BMI is a great population-wide measure, right? When you gave that that number of 94 million, you know, it gives us a, a good kind of proxy of the population. But I told you I want to use waist circumference, body mass index, put those two together to begin to look at individuals. Um, I actually did a whole study where I looked at the National Health and Nutrition nutrition examination survey and looked at all individuals um, with different race and ethnicity, um, different gender, and redrew the BMI lines and published that in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in 2019. And for Black women, interestingly enough, our BMI line does actually scoot up a little tush, a little tush above 30. So for, for Black women, depending upon whether we have like things like high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol, it usually ends up kind of being somewhere between 31 and 33. Um, so a little bit of a shift up. Um, so not too far off from what, you know, is kind of put out there as the measure. But like I said, I want to put those two pieces of the puzzle together. Waist circumference, you guys, at the belly button, 35 inches or less with that BMI picture. And so when you put those two together, you have a lot of information. And if, if, you're, if you're above those and those two combined, then I do think we need to begin to address the obesity itself. Moving over into your second question, Leslie, which was about hormonal changes. There are three primary times during women's lives when we have major hormonal changes that can lead to weight gain. Um, first is when we first get our menstrual cycle, when we're teenagers or for, for black girls actually, and that's both here in the US and in Europe, we actually are, are earlier than white women, for example. Um, and so our average age for getting our, our menstrual cycles is much earlier. So you can see weight shifts at that time. If a woman decides to have children or get pregnant, we can see major weight shifts. And then going to that question you asked me about menopause, that mm -hmm. menopausal transition, we see a decline in a hormone called estradiol, which is basically estrogen. And we go from having a gynoid distribution of weight, which means hip, buttock and thigh region, right? That what we think about as black women to having an Android, like the phone, yes, but Android means central, meaning fat that you carry in your midsection. Mm -hmm. So just that hormonal change that happens as we make that transition into menopause is, is actually changing our body fat distribution. So much so that the number one person that actually seeks care for obesity treatment is postmenopausal or perimenopausal white women. Now, notice how I said white women. And I didn't say black women, even though this is the black women's health initiative. The reason why is because we often don't seek care for our obesity. Mm -hmm. We presume that it's something that a label that we've been put on and it's a bad label that's been attached instead of recognizing that there are people like me that spent the last 35 years training to care for patients that actually have this disease. And let me tell you, I do it best for our people, particularly black women. But that's extremely important time of life where we see major weight shifts, even if you're doing all the right things, eating well, exercising well, you're like, what happened to my body? And that's something that I am keen upon testing. I've published a lot in this area. And I think it's a, it's a great group for us to continue to do study and work with, but we have, we have treatment options. We, we're getting also a lot of questions about this, Dr. Stanford. If <laughs> diet and exercise doesn't work, what right. are some other options for us as women? 
Absolutely. I am so glad you did that. I'm glad we got to go there because I was hoping we would go there. Yes, we're um, going to get there. <laughs> um, you know, it's important for us to recognize that we have a range of tools and therapies that are evidence based, meaning we've studied them time and time again. And we know that medications, for example, are a great tool that we can utilize for patients that have overweight and obesity. I use medications in probably over 70% of my patients, both children and adults that have obesity. And these medications act on how the brain sees weight. They may act on how adipose is actually distributed, it may actually act to increase our energy expenditure when we're just sitting at rest, like we are kind of having a conversation here. So these medications are safe and effective. Um, it often takes some trial and error to find out the right combination of medications. Um, but keep in mind that if we're going to use medications for weight regulation, if they work, I always tell my patients, if they work, we don't stop the medications. We're treating a chronic disease process. When we pull the medicine away, weight comes back to where it was prior to the introduction of the medication because it's acting, you know, only as much as we're giving it. Let's step over to one of the, my favorite therapies. Um, but let me also make a note there. Only about 2% of people that, that meet qualifications for medications in the U.S. for obesity, only 2% actually use them. So it means we have 98% of people that, that could use medications to help treat their obesity just like they do to treat their high blood pressure or their diabetes or anything else that are just not using them. The next group or the next um, thing that I want to bring up is surgery. Um, people get fearful and they think it's an easy way out. It is absolutely not. But it is by far the most effective treatment that we have to treat severe obesity. And it is just one tool in a toolbox or a toolkit, which includes things like looking at diet and exercise and stress and sleep that we can utilize for patients that have severe obesity. And I want you to know that even the American Academy of Pediatrics, yes, I said pediatrics, came out just within the last 18 months in strong support of early introduction to surgery for even kids that have severe obesity. Mm. So, and let me tell you, the AAP, which is American Academy of Pediatrics, like literally one of the most conservative organizations <laughs> that I know of. And so for them to recognize that even the benefit, you can imagine that what we can see across the spectrum, I have many black women that I take care of that have undergone surgery, some of them as old as in their 70s, um, that are wishing that they had just done this 30 years ago, but I can't give them back that time. I can only help them be their best self right now. So don't be fearful. Make sure you have a good team of people that recognize it's just a tool. It doesn't, it's not the magic bu bullet. It's not a panacea. It's just one of many tools that can be utilized to care for patients that have obesity. And I think we should utilize the appropriate tool for the size of the problem. Yeah. Okay. It's yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That word. What'd you say? <laughs> I learned the word panacea. Oh, you like that, Lonnie. See, you know, I have to give my sore a little bit of a, you know, a little thing, a little, little bit there. <laughs> Thank right? you. But I would yeah. also say, don't be, don't be, fearful, but don't be ashamed, right? There, there should well, be no shame. Thing. So yes, I agree. They shouldn't be ashamed, but I let my patients determine whether or not they're going to share publicly, you know, if they're on medicines or if surgery, because yeah. there is so much bias and stigma, you know, right. if some, you know, I think that there are certain key yeah. celebrities that have had interventions um, that, you know, are reticent to let us know that they've had such interventions because yeah. of the bias and stigma associated with using surgery. It's not using surgery. It's about using clinically yeah. effective proven tools. Why can't we use them? Why yeah. are we going to let, why is it that 70% of the people that get surgery are white women when we know this disproportionately impacts our community much more? Why is it when you're looking at kids that is still white women or white girls that are getting surgery? Um, it's, you know, we, we have these tools, we have the experts, yeah. let's use them we, we know how to do this. Let's, let's help you be your best self. Yeah. And I think it's not about whether or not you share with people or not. I've used some of these interventions. I think the point is that you can't mm -hmm. let your, your shame about Absolutely. it prevent mm -hmm. you from going to access it. Right. That's yeah. what, which is the reality like is people tend to think that to lose weight, you just need to be more disciplined. You just need to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
actually not that. This is a disease to your point. And you have to attack it like you would attack any other major health issue in your life. And if that means there are tools out there that you can access that will help you to do that, you should do that and you should do it without shame, whether or not you ever share it with anybody. I completely yeah. agree. And I think like, let's say someone had a diagnosis of cancer, right? And they're like, oh, you know, we need to treat this cancer. You don't sit there and think, hmm, you know, I don't know if I want to use that treatment. You know, people may judge me. We don't even think in that way, right? But we right. do as right. it relates to That's obesity. Right. Like, oh yeah. my gosh, I don't know if we should yeah. do that. Um, and it's and it's 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 hurting us because we, you know, yeah. especially for those of us that have access to these tools. I mean, I can tell you, I struggle with this in my own family. People that I know yeah. that that I'm, they have the expert. I've done more fellowship training in obesity medicine than anyone in this country. So why is it that I sometimes struggle with getting my own family and then I'm able to treat everyone else in the world? You can imagine the struggle and hurt that I have experienced surrounding that, right? Yeah. So that I'm able to help all of the strangers and they get, get well. And then people in my own family still wow. suffer despite yep. having the yep. Harvard expert, right? Yep. It's, it's not fair. And but I, I can only, I can't, you can, what you can lead a horse to, to, to water, right? But you can't make them drink, right? This was saying, so that's all I can do. Well, you know, and it's just the point of, I think what we've all been saying is that each woman has to take care of herself. You right. cannot look at your friends and, 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 and feel ashamed and, you know, that's them. You cannot, if you decide what you're going to do, do it because it's for you. You have to take care of yourself. Put that mask on yourself first. Then you can save everybody else, but you can't yes. what your girlfriend's doing and what your what your family doing. Save yourself, save your health. That's first. I think those are really important things to say. And I should mention before we go, you know, I've met several people who've lost a lot of weight who have actually needed what you talk about, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Stanford, that psychological component, because mm -hmm. People see them differently, but they may not see themselves differently. And so for the women who embark on this journey, and it is not always easy, as you've heard Lonnie and, and Courtney say uh, so courageously, that they're going to be different parts of this journey. And part of that is making sure you have what you need to get through it. So whether it's building community through the Peloton group or seeing some inspiration in Lonnie and joining one of her challenges, or reaching out to somebody like a Dr. Stanford who has this significant experience in this, there are resources out there. I wanna thank all of you for being just uh, wonderful women to contribute to this courageous conversation, this safe space, free of judgment and bias and stigma. We need more of this amongst ourselves. We need more of this in the broader sphere of things. And so I hope that all of you who've joined us go off into the world feeling a little more loved, feeling a little more lifted, and a little more encouraged to do the things for you to be your very best self. So to our wonderful Lonnie Love, our amazing Dr. Stanford and our encouraging Courtney Snowden. Thank you for being here. And I will hopefully, if you're in the DC area, maybe you'll watch tonight at five, six and 11. Big hearts to everybody, lots of love. <laughs> uh, be safe wherever you are, be healthy wherever you are, be your best wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Great Thank job, you. Leslie. Yes, yes, excellent job. Conversation.